So uh, tonight we're going to continue our look at the uh, the prophets, and we're looking at Zechariah. So uh, one of the th main things we find in Zechariah are a lot of promises regarding Christ and uh, and what he's going to bring. Uh, but he is prophesying at the same time as Haggai, who we looked at last time. And they were, remember, uh, in Ezra 5, it says that the prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to the Jews uh, to, to get them to build the house of God, the temple, again. Now, Haggai, the last prophecy we have from him in chapter uh, ten, uh, 2, verse 10, it tells us that it, it was on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius. Uh, and in at the beginning of Zechariah, it says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius. So this is a month before the last prophecy of Haggai, but it's going to continue on uh, a bit longer, uh, even even a couple of years, as we will see in uh, in in the book of Zechariah. So uh, what what we have here is a a message from God. In verse 2, it says, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds, but they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. So he's, he's warning the people. They've already started building the temple by this time, but he's, he's continuing to tell them, don't be like your fathers. Don't be like the rebellious people who did not listen to the prophets before. In verses 5 and 6, he says, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, deeds, so he has dealt with us. So they acknowledge that what God had said through the prophets is what happened, and it's because of what their fathers did, what their nation did. And it's interesting that you know God says that the, the fathers didn't live forever, the prophets also didn't live forever, but my words, which I commanded them, they, they overtook them. And so uh, the, the idea is that, that the words that the prophets speak are much more important than the prophets themselves because they're coming from God. In verse 7, it, it talks about in the 11th month, uh, the word of the Lord came. And what we're going to find is that he, he sees some visions in the book of Zechariah. The first one is of various colored horses led by a man on a red horse. And these are the ones that the Lord sent to walk back and forth throughout the earth and report. And they report that the earth is resting quietly, which sounds like a good thing, but it's actually not a good thing because the earth should be punished for you know, the, the nations that were against the Jews, uh, they should be punished for their evil intent <clears throat> in destroying Jerusalem. But God was going to establish <clears throat> Jerusalem in mercy. And we see there's four craftsmen coming to terrify the four horns of the nations that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And there was a man measuring Jerusalem to see how big it was. And the point there is that it was actually going to be inhabited as if it had no walls. So the size didn't, didn't make such a big difference because God is going to be the wall around it. The population is going to spread out. And uh, those that still lived among the nations are called on to return to Jerusalem. But it, it is a looking forward to the church and how the kingdom of God, the spiritual uh, Jerusalem, is going to, uh, to, to fill the earth. In chapter 2, in verses 8 through 13, uh, we find here wording that indicates the existence of the Father and Jesus talking here uh, in this discussion. So it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me 
after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. So in red here, that's, I believe, Jesus talking. And then in blue, that's the Father that he's referring to. Uh, Because he's talking about the Lord sending him, but it's the Lord speaking as well. So you have both of them in this discussion. And, uh, and we, we find a, a few cases like that throughout Zechariah. We, we find a vision then of Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and with Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord who appears to be Jesus here tells Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I say it appears to be Jesus because I don't know why he would say the Lord rebuke you if he's not referring to the other One, uh, as that discussion that we just saw, um, because it is the Lord saying this. So I think that's Jesus here. But anyway, Joshua is clothed in filthy garments, but these are taken away from him. And he's given rich robes and a clean turban, uh, which accompanied his iniquity or sin being removed from him. And this is a sign of the coming of Jesus to remove the iniquity of the land. And Uh, In chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, it says, Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, uh, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. So now here, this is the father speaking, uh, talking about sending Jesus. And it says, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon the stone are seven eyes. Uh, Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. So this prophecy of of Jesus coming, his servant, the branch, uh, and this he will be removing the iniquity of the land in that day. And but he, he has this strange picture of this stone that has seven eyes. In the book of Revelation, we have seven eyes mentioned as well. And it it says in Revelation 5, 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And as far as I understand it, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And the idea of seven being, it's just the idea that he can be everywhere at once. That's the seven eyes seeing everywhere at once. Uh, I might not understand it perfectly, but that's that's the way I understand it. Uh, And the book of Revelation can help you understand some of the things in Zechariah. The things in Zechariah can help you understand some of the things in Revelation. There's actually a lot from Zechariah, the imagery there in Revelation. Uh, but in the, back in Zechariah, Zechariah saw a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top with seven lamps and seven pipes to the seven lamps. Uh, and there's two olive trees on the right hand and on the left. This is a picture we find in Revelation as well. It says that these are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. In Revelation, I think it's talking about someone different uh, specifically than what he's talking about in Zechariah. So I think in in Revelation, he's talking about Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. And in Zechariah, it seems to be Zerubbabel and Joshua. But again, I could be wrong, but those are some things to to look at as you go through the book. In Zechariah 4, verses 6 through 10, there's a great prophecy of, of how Zerubbabel is going to finish the building of the temple, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, uh, says the Lord of hosts. And it's going to be by grace. There, he's going to bring forth a capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. It's a, it's a gift from God that he's able to do this. It's not by might or by power. God is enabling him to do this. And, um, and so we... We see also that uh, in, in verse 10, the seven eyes are referred to again. 
Uh, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. And so we have this picture of God who sees everything everywhere, uh, and but but he is uh, rejoicing to see Zerubbabel doing the work that he wants him to do. Then there's a vision of a flying scroll. It's huge. It's uh, nine meters by four and a half meters, and it's a curse over the whole earth against thieves and perjurers. And related to that, he sees a basket with a woman who represents wickedness sitting in the basket. And the basket has a heavy disc uh, to put on top, a heavy lid. And the woman's thrust down. The lid is placed on top where she can't get out. And two women with wings come and take it to the land of Shinar or Babylonia. And this seems to be a picture of removing wickedness from Judah and Jerusalem so that it just remains among the enemies of God. And uh, this can't be a picture of something happening to the physical nation, but with the spiritual Israel, when the new covenant is established in Christ, this would be a picture of that. We then have the horses returning, but this time they're pulling four chariots coming from between two bronze mountains, and each one has a, a di different colored horses pulling them, red, black, white, and dappled. These are the same colors that we find in Revelation 6, um, and uh, they, they're walking back and forth over the earth, but while the earth was at rest before... These chariots are going to bring rest to the Spirit of God in the North Country. In other words, he's going to punish them, these oppressors of the Jews, of, of his people. So in Zechariah 6, verse 9 through 15, we have then some people coming, and they, they bring a gift of silver and gold, and God tells them to make an elaborate crown and put it on the head of Joshua, the high priest. And this is a prophecy of the man whose name is the branch, that's Jesus, that he's going to, to, to come and build the temple of the Lord and sit and rule on his throne and be a priest on his throne. So they're putting a crown on the high priest. The high priest here is not truly uh, at the ruler, but it's a, he, this is a sign of the one who would be high priest and king. Uh, who would also build the temple. And of course, that is Jesus. Um, all right. And two years then before the temple was finished, some men came to the temple to ask the priests and the prophets if they should continue weeping in the fifth month and fast as they had been doing. God asks, have you ever really been doing it for God? And it, it seems like God had never commanded that fast. And there were other things God had commanded that they were not keeping. So God reminds them that the nation as a whole has not listened to the word that came through the law and the former prophets, and that's why they were scattered among the nations. In chapter 7, verse 9 through 10, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion, everyone, to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. This was a, a very common message in the prophets. Uh, and he wanted the, them to actually listen and do it. But God does promise that he's not going to deal with these people the same way uh, as he did to, the, to their fathers, and they would turn the fasting days into cheerful feasts. And so people would come from other nations to seek the Lord and pray before him, that he asked Jews to let them accompany them to Jerusalem because they had heard that God was with them. And again, I think this is a, a picture of, of the, the church ultimately. So then God gives Zechariah prophecies against various nations, and this was going to remove those who oppress God's house, uh, which they were built, busy building, right, the temple. And, uh, and the company of, of the, the, the coming of the king, who is Jesus, is prophesied as one who brings peace and rules the whole earth. God contrasts himself with lying idols, and those who follow those are like sheep without a shepherd. God is going to punish shepherds who are not doing their job and become the shepherd himself to make his people mighty and give them victory. And he has Zechariah become a shepherd for a time uh, for the sheep whose shepherd slaughtered them and felt no guilt. And at the end of the time, he's paid 30 pieces of silver. He's instructed to throw that money into the house of God for the potter. And, uh, and then God would, 
after that, raise up a shepherd who would not care for the sheep, but destroy them. And then God would punish that worthless shepherd. Uh, And so this is a prophecy of Jesus coming for a time, being the good shepherd on earth. And the price set for him would be 30 pieces of silver. That would be thrown into the temple used to buy the potter's field. After that, the shepherds or leaders of Israel would destroy Israel. And, uh, and so uh, that, that appears to be a, a pretty straightforward understanding of, of this particular prophecy. Uh, God then promises to defend Jerusalem against all the nations that come against it, and all in the kingdom would be equal without one group being greater than another. And he, he prophesies about Jesus being crucified in the sense that he says, they will look on me whom they pierced and mourn for him. And in chapter 13, verse 1, he says, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David uh, and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. So God is going to cut off the names of the idols and cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. And uh, he, he prophesies that his shepherd, who is a man and is God's companion, that's Jesus, would, stri- would be struck and the sheep would be scattered. And, uh, and so, you know, this idea of him dying is, is pretty clear if you understood it in the book of Zechariah. Um, and so, two-thirds would be cut off and die, but one-third would be left, and they'd be brought through the fire, refined and tested. They'd be God's people. And then all the nations would come against Jerusalem. Half of the city would go into captivity, but the remnant would remain in the city. And then God would fight against those nations and be king over all the earth. And he'd bring a horrible plague against those who fought against Jerusalem. In other words, against his people. And everyone who was left of the nations would come to Jerusalem to worship every year and keep the Feast of Tabernacles and everything would be holy to God. There'd be no rain for those who did not come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, the Feast of Tabernacles is the feast that reminds the Jews of when they came out of slavery in Egypt and they were provided for in the wilderness for 40 years. And we come out of slavery to sin. God provides for us while we're in this wilderness. And so those who keep the Feast of Tabernacles or those who've been delivered from sin remember and appreciate it. The closest physical thing we have to that is the Lord's Supper, which serves a similar purpose. I don't think it's referring to the Lord's Supper specifically, but the idea of, of uh, keeping this memorial, remembering what God has done for us, that, that's the important thing. And so in this book, we have Zechariah working with Haggai uh, to get the people of Judah building the temple again and encouraging them as they do it. And he prophesied later, but longer than Haggai. And uh, he focuses mostly on prophecies of Jesus to encourage the people in their work. This includes Jesus coming as a shepherd, being struck down, opening a fountain of cleansing from sin and ruling as king. And uh, these prophecies show that God had something wonderful that he'd bring in the future for his people. And if they'd be faithful and do the work of building the temple, they would have a role in bringing about the promises of an even greater temple. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's a whole lot we skipped over there, but I hope that that is helpful to you. Thank you.